Did the historical Jesus claim to be divine? This is one of the difficult questions that divide Christians from rival groups, uh, such as Islam. And in fact, in Islam, if Jesus did claim to be divine, then um, Islam is false, since it, under Islam you have to believe um, whatever Jesus says. Uh, in Judaism, it's maybe a little bit more difficult um, because there's a sense that rabbis are divine in some sense. So maybe you could fit into that. Uh, but regardless, if Jesus, the historical figure, claimed to be divine, um, it's pretty good evidence that we should listen to what he has to say. Now, there's a slight distinction between saying that Jesus claimed to be divine versus he claimed to be God. Um, in one sense, they're the same claim, but the, the claim that he claimed to be God um, can also be taken in a misleading way. Here's, a, here's an example. There's this is of identity when I say is, uh, Bruce Wayne is Batman. I mean, I'm using two terms to designate the same object. Um, and when we say Jesus is God or Yahweh, we're not trying to use two terms to designate literally the same thing. What we are instead doing is we're saying that Jesus is divine as a predicate. Um, like when I say my car is red, right? Red is a property of my car, and divinity would be more like a property of Jesus. This, this is the claim. We're not trying to say that he and Yahweh um, are two terms for the same thing. Um, that actually was dismissed as monarchianism and heresy. So this is why we try to say Jesus, did Jesus claim to be divine? It just, it eliminates that entire ambiguity. Now, historiography. It's the process of how we know history. How do we know what happened in the past? Because we don't directly observe history, we have to treat history more like a crime scene, where we're matching hard data to theories and trying to say which theories best explain the hard data. So the criteria of a good theory is the ability first to predict future discoveries. If your theory about, let's say, the ancient Hittites is able to predict the unearthing of a certain library, like if you dig here it should um, give us a library than people did, and then it gives us a library, that's a really good theory. If it has good explanatory power, uh, it, it very strongly explains the data. If it has good explanatory scope, it explains all the data, or lots of the data, as opposed to a little bit. Degree of ad hocness means we have to an ad hoc hypothesis is where you have to posit things that you don't have independent evidence for, or have very weak independent evidence for. For example, there's a theory that the 9-11 buildings were brought down by thermite bombs. Now, normal thermite cannot destroy the steel in the way that um, the steel was destroyed, actually, in those, in those buildings. And so, conspiracy theorists have to posit special weapons-grade thermite that's, like, painted on the steel I-beams. I mean, that's fine, it, it explains the destruction, but we have no independent evidence for it other than to rescue the theory. So it's ad hoc and that gives it weakness. And ad hocness is one of the things that scuttles conspiracy theorists from mainstream history. Plausibility and coherence with accepted beliefs. How well does this theory cohere with what is generally accepted by the mainstream historical community? So that's not as important as the other ones, but it, again, it helps us separate good from bad theories. The hard data. We have archaeology, stuff we dig up in the dirt. Um, we have enormous amounts of archaeological data to support the historicity of the New Testament, particularly Luke and Acts. Someone wrote a 17-volume series connecting Luke and Acts to all this hard archaeology, verifying basically every person, place, and thing in those books. So that's definitely good for historicity. We have the writings from the New Testament, we have the Church Fathers, and we also have outside sects, such as some king who wrote a letter to Jesus inviting him to come on in to help heal his family. Um, we're not sure what came of that. Jesus didn't leave the area, so presumably he turned it down. But that letter helps to establish hard, hard data. Um, if you don't believe that Jesus existed or that he wasn't a miracle worker, now it's harder to explain writings such as that. So our challenge is going to be, how does your theory best explain the rise of the hard data relative to rival theories? And are supernatural explanations justified? Uh, are we going to dismiss supernatural explanations, let's say, for like the origin of life, uh, you know, a priori, ahead of time? Or are we going to allow them on the table um, as rival explanations that can possibly win out? Or, or, is it, or are you so stubborn that, like, I don't know is a better uh, explanation than... God did it. Because if that's your if that's your uh, theory, if that's your belief, then you've already dismissed 
a priori any and all appeals, any all possibility of miracles, possibility of supernatural intervention, and cannot then say that there's some lack of evidence for the supernatural, because you've already just said it can't possibly exist before even investigating the evidence. So um, this isn't as important regarding the self-image of Jesus, but when it comes to things like the resurrection, the miracles, the Old Testament miracles, these are all relevant. Okay, justifying historical descriptions. This is C.B. Han McCullough's kind of magnum opus, where he discusses what historical explanations are good and what are bad, and what criteria we use within mainstream history to determine good from bad theories. All right, so the first piece of evidence is going to be the testimony of Ignatius. And he says, there is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and of spirit, both made and not made, God existing in the flesh, true life and death, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. Basically, Ignatius in 107 is calling Jesus God in the highest and strongest sense. He's just calling him uh, divine in the full, complete ontological sense, uh, not in a small sense, not in a reduced sense, not in a merely represent representative sense, but in a very high and strong sense. So the question is, what? Um, how do you explain this? What are the best explanations for how he came to this conclusion? We also have biblical data that Jesus is called God in some sense. He's described as only God can be described, and he's worshipped as only God can be worshipped. The first is Jesus is called God. We have um, the waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our, the glory of our great God and Savior, to Megalutheu Kesutero Simon, uh, Jesus Christ. And the Granville Sharp, uh, the Granville Sharp rule basically prevents us from splitting uh, great God and Savior into separate things. They designate the same object. And the Granville Sharp rule takes about a page to explain, but it has no counterexamples either in the New Testament or in outside Greek writings. It just, it's, a, it's a hard rule of Greek grammar. We also have one from Simon Peter basically saying the same thing, uh, the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. In Romans 9, 5, we have, To them belong the patriarchs from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever, amen, or over all the eternally blessed God. And we also have in Hebrews 1, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so here we have Jesus being called God, um, Atheos. We have the Carmen Christi, a very important um, piece of oral tradition. It's actually pre-Pauline, and so it's, it's definitely before 35. And it says this, Have in mind amongst yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be exploited, but empty himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we have two... Uh, two parts of this pre-Pauline oral tradition. The first is that Jesus was in the form of God, to more free theu. And the term form is the same thing that Aristotle uses, or Plato uses, for his forms. And he says equality with God was not a thing to be exploited. So we have Jesus, or the divine logos, as equal uh, with God, equal with uh, Hashem, or Yahweh. And we also have here, as we have the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, uh, and every tongue confess. Now this is a, a reference to to um, Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 45, uh, which is also a reference about Yahweh, about Hashem, um, about the God of Israel. And so we have two two sections of this uh, early pre-Pauline world tradition call, uh, equating Jesus with the God of Israel. Um, we also have Jesus being described as only God can be described. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body and the church, the beginning of the firstborn, um, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to, do, to dwell, and through him... To reconcile himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, made peace by the blood of the cross. So now he is the uh, image of the invisible God, but he's also, in, in this sense, uh, the fullness of deity, of Theotetos. Um, that which makes God God dwells in the risen Jesus in bodily form. 
Um, we also have Jesus worshipped, as only God can be worshipped. Uh, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And behold, Jesus uh, met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took the hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said, You have seen him. He was speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now, someone might say, yeah, the term uh, pr proskino means pro to prostrate rather than to just fully worship. In the, the New Testament, proskino is always used for worship. Um, there's a couple places where, like an angel, or actually the apostles, were going to receive proskino, and they refuse. They say, no, a worship, proskino, God alone. So, yes, outside the New Testament, it can mean things other than worship, but in the New Testament, there's really no evidence of the contrary. It's used for the full, that which is due to God alone, but it's given to Jesus. Uh, and finally, the nail in the coffin is Revelation 5. It's written somewhere between 90 and 100. Uh, it is late for the New Testament, but it is first century and even before Ignatius. And here is the apocalyptic vision from this guy, John of Patmos. He says, I looked and I heard the throne and living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and glory and honor and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down in worship. And so we have this scene where this lamb who has been slain receives the full, uh, it's called Latria, um, Latria, the absolute highest conceivable form of worship by literally all of creation. It's, it's the ultimate kind of worship that's due to God alone, and to give it to any creature it just, it would make idolatry just irrelevant. Like, there can't be any such thing as idolatry if a creature can receive the, this kind of extreme and full worship of God. But yet, if it's applied to Jesus, it shows that he is God, or, or at least that the author believes that he is God in this extremely high sense. Um, you also have quotes, early quotes, um, from Jesus, uh, accepted even by very liberal scholars, even by like the Jesus Seminar. Um, we have, where um, both in, I think it's both Matthew and Q, uh, or Matthew and, and Luke, therefore it's a Q source, it's even, it's a, like as early as Mark. And, and Jesus says, "All things have been handed over be, to, by me, uh, to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him." Now remember, for the post-Easter Church, Jesus is very much knowable. You can know him. You can know him right now. But here he is. Here Jesus is saying that he is unknowable, and therefore this is very unlikely to have been made up uh, after the fact. Uh, it is an authentic saying of Jesus. And he is giving, he's putting himself in this extremely high position above all the prophets, above even Moses, uh, right up to being next to God. And that's a very, very extreme self-image. This is not a mere good moral teacher. Uh, we have no one knows the day or the hour, where Jesus says, but concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So again, the church is not going to make up a saying where Jesus claims not to know something if they're going to claim him to be God. Now the way out of this is simply understanding that in um, Greco-Roman culture, the father, the head of the household, the, pa the pater familias, uh, had this official honor of knowing, and I say that in quotes, knowing, quote, knowing, unquote, the day or the hour of the wedding, but unofficially other people knew so they can make preparations. And so that's what this is. This is showing the honor, uh, the father has this very special honor of knowing um, the day or the hour um, of the return of Jesus. So it doesn't interfere with any doctrine of divine omniscience, but also it places Jesus on this ascending scale above the prophets and even the angels in heaven. Uh, a very, very high level uh, view of him and also very unlikely to have been made up. And therefore, it's an authentic saying of Jesus. And finally, the son of, there's the Son of Man imagery um, in Daniel and also in other apocalyptic literature such as 4th Ezra. Uh, and here, um, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which is, shall not pass away. 
in this kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Um, we also have, then we have Jesus claiming himself to be that kind of son of man, this extremely high figure. So we have, um, Um, we have the, the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Obviously, I mean, who is that? Someone else? No, clearly it's Jesus. In fact, there's a passage in Luke where he says to Judas, like, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Like, how many people is Judas kissing? Clearly it is about Jesus, and clearly he is seeing himself as this very high, exalted heavenly figure who's given just extraordinarily amount, uh, extraordinary amounts of power. And so again, this is not some general moral teacher. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in, in the glory um, with the Father, with his holy angels. And we also have in Mark 14, um, the high priest says, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do you need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Why do they condemn him? Obviously not for calling himself Messiah. There's people to this day who have called themselves Messiah. I mean, there was a guy at the Shabbat dinner uh, where I was with who had his, inside his jacket this term Mashiach ben David. This guy thought him of himself as Messiah, son of David, this Orthodox Jew. So it's not really blasphemy to claim yourself to be Messiah. But when he calls himself the Son of Man, uh, this exalted heavenly divine figure, um, the high priest just couldn't stand it at that point. He's like, "This is total blasphemy for someone to, some you know, you this mere mortal to equate yourself with someone that extraordinary." We have him, uh, Jesus, healing a paralytic. Um, where basically Jesus says, "Your sins are forgiven you." Uh, this is clearly a divine prerogative. This is the sort of thing um, that only God can do, and. People said, like who, like, who is able to forgive sins but God alone? Yeah, exactly. Then we also have Lord of the Sabbath, uh, another thing that God himself instituted. And yet, uh, Jesus himself is claiming this dominion and control and power over the Sabbath, that, uh, this kind of power um, that only the establisher of the Sabbath has, that only God has. So again, this is another divine prerogative that Jesus himself had. And these are both, by the way, uh, Mark and uh, the earliest written source that we available to us. And so conclusion is, um, historiography is about matching the best explanation to the, bat, to the data. The earliest followers of Jesus all considered him to be divine. By the end of the first century, the followers of Jesus considered him, him to be divine in this crazy high sense. Um, there's claims in the earliest Christian writings that Jesus talked about himself as divine. And so the best explanation for all of this data is that Jesus considered himself to be divine. Uh, if you want to say he, he, he didn't, now you need to come up with an explanation, something that, that explains all of his hard data um, without Jesus actually claiming himself to be divine. And it's going to fail one of these criteria. It's going to be ad hoc, it's going to fail to explain things, um, it's going to be implausible, uh, and it's going to have very poor predictive power. So any theory that denies Jesus claimed himself to be God or to be divine in some sense is simply going to fail the mainstream uh, criteria we use for doing history, for doing secular history. So if we hold a consistent view of history, the best explanation for all of this data is that the historical Jesus of Nazareth did consider himself to be divine.